All right, good morning, everyone. It's 8.30, uh, time to get started. I uh, have a great presentation for you this morning. Uh, someone that was born into the, into the construction industry, kind of like myself, growing up uh, with my, my dad being a carpenter. Uh, we've got a continuous insulation for code compliant, high performance walls in type one through four construction. Um, and the grant stall with Hunter Panels uh, get discussing that with us this morning. Uh, a few quick notes before we get started uh, to receive your ICC CEUs for the presentation this morning. Mariel will send out a course evaluation. If you'll just fill that out, she'll send you ICC CEUs. Um, we'll hold all questions to the end. If you'll just click on the Q&A or the hand icon um, on, the, on the toolbar there, you can type in your questions and, and I'll read those. We'll, we'll go through those at the end of the presentation. Uh, a few announcements. We do have some upcoming uh, in-person HVAC trainings that I'll be given uh, in San Antonio, May 16th. June 4th, getting back to my college town of Lubbock. And then on June 11th, El Paso. So if you want more information about those, just let me know. My email will be coming up in a slide or two. Uh, next slide. And then uh, Cassidy Ellis, our local government program manager, has a webinar coming up on the business case for street lighting retrofits. If any of the sustainability folks in your, at your city or anybody might be interested um, in street lighting retrofits, we have a webinar May 16th. You see the email address here. Feel free to reach out to Cassidy or me about that. And then as always, um, standing offer. Any of you inspectors that use third parties for energy inspections, if you would like for me to do some QAQC of those third party guys, I know y'all are busy and don't have time to make sure they're dotting I's and crossing T's. I'd be happy to come out and do some of that for you. Uh, sit down with your plan reviewers and look at energy code specific uh, plan review aspects and submittals. Happy to do that. Field inspection training. Uh, if you're not on the 15 yet and are bringing the 15 to council, I'd be happy to sit in the council, city council and answer any questions give lunch and learn for your builders or inspectors. Uh, we are an ICC preferred provider, so any presentations I give, you would get ICC CU credits for. And then also uh, contractor registration forms, sample ordinances, uh, energy testing uh, submittal forms, any of those IECC related forms, resources, guidance, et cetera, feel free to reach out. And then uh, first time ever, my name is in a book. Uh, we just, the ICC G4 commissioning guideline book just came out. And then there's also uh, ASHRAE just published a uh, commissioning stakeholders guide with a bunch of checklists. And uh, so, so I have a bunch of new commissioning related information and resources. So please just let me know. There's my email address. And with that, Grant, if you'll just click over to share your screen, uh, introduce yourself and get, get us started. Okay, I'm trying to, uh, trying to do that here. Um, hang on just a second. All right. Did it come up? It does. It did. We're looking at your documents library screen. <laughs> well, let's see what we can do to change that. All righty. All right. Uh, display settings here. Are you getting the, the slide now? Not yet. I'm getting all gray now. We had it okay. right a second ago. We, we hopped on early, folks. We, we <laughs> like all technology, it works the first time and then the second time. I, I, I yesterday I, I messed up my view settings in my Outlook and I cannot get it back to the way it was to save my life. It's driving me nuts. It says I'm viewing your screen. But uh, I'm just showing the, uh, a gray screen. 
I don't know if okay. maybe you need to click uh, presentation on your slides, or I, I'm not sure, but it's... It's coming up on, I'm going to escape out of it here, okay. and uh, let's see if I can, are you seeing anything now? Uh, the documents library screen again. All right. It says my screen sharing is paused. Okay, so so click on share. Actually, I, I'm going to stop your screen sharing. Go back to mine, and then we'll and then we'll <laughs> start start over. Okay, now now so everyone's seeing mine. So go back on to share, and you should be able to do it. All right, this will stop other screen sharing. Do I want to continue? I'm going to yes. say yes. All right, and I'm going to. Now we're good. Now we're good. All yeah, right. just click so, on slide. There you go. You're off and running. All right. So let me ask you one more time here. Um, I'm seeing your notes now, but there you go. Now I'm not. Looks perfect. All right. Technical difficulties surpassed here. So good morning, everybody. Sorry about the delay there. Um, my name is Grant Stahl, and uh, I work for uh, a polyiso insulation manufacturer by the name of Hunter Panels. Um, I'm doing the presentation today as a member of PEMA which is the Polyiso Insulation Manufacturers Association. And the presentation today is, is titled Continuous Insulation for Code Compliant High Performance Walls in Type 1 through 4 Construction. So we're going to focus on commercial today in the, in the presentation. As Jason mentioned, uh, I, I grew up in the insulation business, uh, in the building materials business. Uh, my grandfather was a mason. Uh, my father sold uh, insulation and building materials, and, and I followed suit. So I've been in the industry for 30-plus years, and before that, uh, you know, grew up surrounded by it. Um, it's a great industry. Uh, a lot of changes. A lot of things stay the same. Uh, but one of the things that's been a change over the past decade-plus is continuous insulation. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that today. So this is an AIA continuing education presentation put together by Pima. Uh, it follows all the AIA guidelines. Uh, it's not going to be product specific. Um, we're going to skip forward to the learning objectives here. And uh, what we aim to do in the presentation uh, today is talk about continuous insulation, what it is, what role it plays, types of products that you may see. Uh, that serve the continuous insulation function. Secondly, we'll talk about applications of continuous insulation, or CI. Um, certainly uh, as an energy efficiency or a thermal function, uh, but different types of continuous insulation, and specifically polyiso or rigid board insulations, uh, can provide water resistive barrier or air barrier functions or even multiple functions, including those or, or uh, materials that help support claddings. We'll talk about energy code compliance, uh, in, including you know, prescriptive R-value tables, uh, U-value uh, performance criteria, as well as uh, modeling and uncertainty analysis uh, as it pertains to energy code compliance. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, building code compliance uh, factors, including fire, structural, and, and building science uh, considerations. So with that, we'll talk first a little bit about Pima. As I mentioned, I work for a polyiso insulation manufacturer. Um, most polyiso manufacturers in North America are members of Pima, which is the polyiso cyanurate. Insulation Manufacturers Association. P 
Pima serves as a uh, advocacy organization. Uh, they're based in Washington, D.C., and, and they provide a unified voice for the rigid polyiso foam board industry. Um, and from an advocacy side of things, uh, uh, they work on issues ensuring uh, safe, sustainable, cost-effective, energy-efficient construction solutions. So if you've got any questions or interest in Pima, you can find information at polyiso.org technical information, educational information, uh, advocacy efforts, all those types of things are available there at the website. So specifically, continuous insulation is what we're here to address. Um, why is it important to learn about continuous insulation? Um, the main reason is it's now required by the codes uh, in all climate zones for all types of walls. Uh, it's been required since 2006, uh, although it's been in use since the early 1900s. It's not a new concept. And, you know, going back several years, things go in and out of favor. There was a lot of continuous insulation used, um, you know, in, in the middle part of the 1900s. As certain things change in construction, you get the invention of new products or different ways of doing things and things change a little bit. Um, but once the code required it in 2006 in the northern tier climate zones, you've seen a lot more usage of continuous insulation. And as the codes have broadened their scope over the last decade plus, uh, it's been incorporated into all climate zones. So again, this presentation is gonna talk primarily commercial type one through four construction. We'll start off with a definition of continuous insulation. And the definition's been pretty constant since uh, you know, it was introduced in the early 2000s. The definition comes from ASHRAE 90.1. This happens to be the 2016 definition. The only change from prior versions is the addition of the word uncompressed to the definition, so we'll read through it. It's uh, insulation that is uncompressed and continuous across all structural members without thermal bridges other than fasteners and service openings. Uh, continuous insulation can be installed on the outside or inside or integral to any opaque surface in the building envelope. So. The thing to, to understand here, fasteners and service openings are allowed. Um, the, the goal is to move things forward from an energy efficiency standpoint, but you can't get away from certain thermal leaks. And fasteners and service openings are allowable. Um, over the last decade, there have been a lot of advancements in fasteners and thermally broken fasteners that have occurred. And we've moved away from certain type of things that could have been used as fasteners that may no longer be allowed in certain areas. And we'll talk about those a little bit later. The role of continuous insulation is such that it's got to satisfy a number of different needs. Uh, certainly, it has to satisfy or exceed uh, structural requirements, green requirements. Um, building and fire code, along with moisture uh, management requirements. So it's gotta be compatible with all those functions in the building, while it still has to address practical requirements, as, as such as you've gotta be able to attach your cladding or siding materials. Um, if you're putting this on the outside of the building, you know, those types of things and attachment methodology is affected. Additionally, it, it's got to be able to satisfy these, these items while still remaining affordable and making sense from a construction practice standpoint. The Building Owners and Managers Association um, has put forth some energy facts, and, and this is why continuous insulation is important. Um, buildings contribute. Uh, 18% of U.S. carbon dioxide emissions, um, and uh, you know, from a sustainability standpoint, uh, we want to get a handle on that. And insulation, continuous insulation, can help in that fact. 
Uh, additionally, for building owners, uh, energy expense is the single largest controllable operating expense in, in commercial buildings. So it's, it's an important feature. It's not necessarily pretty or visible, but uh, it, it's got significant importance. When you look at above grade walls uh, and the types of continuous insulation products that uh, you'd likely run into out there, these are the main ones. Um, you've got rigid foam boards, sometimes referred to as foam plastic insulating sheathing materials. You've got spray foams. Most of the time when used as continuous insulation, they're gonna be closed cell products. And then you've got fibrous products, which can be rock wool, mineral wool, fiberglass, board type products, semi-rigids. The, the rigid board products uh, are expanded polystyrene, extruded polystyrene, and polyiso. Uh, those two are, are, are closed cell foams, similar to spray foams. Um, the fibrous products um, typically rely on trapped air to, uh, to provide the insulating value um, between the fibers. They trap air between the fibers to provide their insulation performance. Um, more often than not, fiberglass boards will be used on the interior side of the wall. They don't do very well with moisture. Rock wool or stone wool products will, will be used on the exterior side of the wall or interior side. As you look at uh, foam plastic insulated sheathing rigid foam boards, um, they're very widely used uh, for continuous insulation um, because uh, they come in board form. Uh, they're easy to install. Uh, people know what they're getting. Um, and uh, you know, they've got a very responsible impact on the environment. Uh, the foam boards out there today uh, essentially have uh, zero ozone depleting potential in the chemicals that are used to make them uh, and virtually zero global warming uh, uh, potential. Uh, and they can be used in all kinds of different applications, uh, office buildings, industrial, commercial, education, high rise, you name it. When you talk about durability of, uh, of continuous insulation products, uh, rigid foam boards don't rot, decay, or corrode. Uh, closed cell foams are just that, they're closed cells, so they don't absorb water, and they do very well in wet environments. Uh, fibrous products, uh, if they're not properly protected, uh, can be prone to moisture damage because uh, uh, they will suck up water or trap it, which is not good for the wall assembly. So I mentioned there are three main types of, of rigid foam boards or foam plastic insulated sheathing materials. Uh, the three are uh, expanded polystyrene, or EPS as it's called extruded polystyrene, or XPS, or polyisocyanate foam, uh, or polyiso. Expanded polystyrene products, uh, uh, you're probably all familiar with them. Uh, it's a white beadboard. Sometimes it's referred to as beadboard. It's material you often see in the exterior environment, probably behind stucco or, or EFS, uh, you know, polymer stucco products. Um, but it's the same type of stuff that you see in, you know, inexpensive coolers or coffee cups. Extruded, extruded polystyrene XPS materials, uh, those are colored boards typically uh, that denote a, a specific manufacturer's identity. Uh, the biggest ones that you'll see out there are blue, pink, yellow, or green boards. And then polyiso foams are uh, cream colored foam, typically sandwiched between a top and a bottom facer material. And uh, most commonly in wall above grade use, you're going to see uh, polyiso products with foil facings on the top and bottom or coated glass mat facings on the top and bottom, similar to a gypsum sheathing facer. Um, you know, people are probably most familiar with polyiso from commercial roofing application. It's been a long time staple of uh, commercial roof use. 
and uh, the same benefits that uh, apply in the roof uh, apply for the wall, and we'll get into that here in a couple of slides. But you can see each of these materials conforms to certain ASTM classifications. Uh, the polystyrene uh, products uh, conform to ASTM C578, which is the standard spec for uh, rigid cellular polystyrene insulation, and the polyiso products um, uh, conform to ASTM C1289. These ASTM standards ensure that the product's performance meets at least a minimum level and oftentimes will exceed uh, those levels for performance. Looking at the three main rigid board types of insulation, um, the reason you're putting insulation on your building is uh, for R value performance or energy efficiency. Uh, all the foam boards use uh, closed cells with blowing agents that the, the, the gases fill the cells of the foam in order to provide uh, uh, thermal performance. Uh, typically, uh, most insulations will try and use some sort of a blowing agent that has a, a better uh, thermal resistance than that of trapped air. Uh, EPS um, actually uses some air, so you, you end up getting an R value close to that of what trapped air is, uh, around a four per inch. Uh, extruded polystyrenes have a, an R value of five per inch, and polyiso products will have an R value of six per inch or greater. Um, depending upon which facer you use, foil face products tend to be the highest R value, uh, having an R value of six to six and a half or greater per inch. Key attributes of, of polyiso insulation uh, are the high R value compared to the other rigid foam boards or even the uh, the fibrous products, fibrous products, again, having using the trapped air uh, as their uh, uh, means to getting R value, they tend to have an R value around four per inch as well. So you're gonna get the highest R value per inch out of polyiso. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so readily used in the roofing environment is high R value. And the three main reasons are high R value uh, per inch, superior fire performance and compatibility with uh, solvent-based adhesives, sealants, and other things you find in the building envelope assembly. Each of those applies to above grade walls as well. Um, you've got moisture resistance, you've got dimensional stability, along with uh, a pretty broad service temperature performance, um, as well as the sustainability items that I mentioned earlier. Uh, you know, regarding zero ozone depleting potential and, and virtually no global warming potential. So polyiso brings a lot of benefits to the table. Um, when you look at the applications of continuous insulation, so we're switching to topic number two here. Um, continuous insulation, as mentioned earlier, has been around for a long time. Uh, and it's not new in certain types of walls. Um, when you think of traditional construction and particularly mass wall construction, so you think of your block-backed brick facade masonry cavity wall, continuous insulation has been used very prevalently in that cavity for many decades. Um, so continuous insulation is not new in that environment where it's still being considered a newer topic is in steel frame wall construction, or framed wall construction in general, but on the commercial side, steel frame wall construction. You think back to what has been traditional in steel frame wall construction in prior decades, you would put some sort of exterior gypsum sheathing directly to the exterior of your steel framing, and maybe a water barrier or a wrap of some sort over the top of that. And then you'd pack the interior stud cavity with insulation materials to, uh, to gain your insulating power for the wall. The problem with doing that is that steel is a conductor. And because it's a conductor, 
the effective R value of that wall assembly, say you've got a six inch steel framed wall and you pack it with R19 bats, your effective uh, R value of that wall assembly is actually about an R of seven. So you're getting less than 50% energy efficiency because of the conductivity of the framing members. It's not by fault of the insulation. Uh, it's just that steel is a conductor. So one of the big adaptations with continuous insulation is in steel frame buildings where the code is requiring a minimum of seven and a half continuous insulation R value uh, outside of the framing members um, in climate zones three and above. And even in uh, climate zones one and two, there's a minimum of R5 required. As you go further north, um, in steel frame walls, you start seeing uh, uh, you, you start seeing those increase uh, even to 12 and a half uh, or 10, uh, depending upon you know which climate zone you're looking at. Looking at if, if they're using ASHRAE 90.1 standard as the measuring stick. Certainly, uh, mass walls and metal buildings aren't exempt. Uh, mentions the definition of continuous insulation changing in ASHRAE 90.1 2016 to include the word uncompressed. If you think about metal buildings, oftentimes those are insulated by laminated fiberglass uh, being draped over the purlins and girts uh, to insulate those buildings. Well, since fibrous materials get their insulating power from trapping air between the fibers, when you compress that material over the purlins and girts, you're losing all the insulating power there. So you've got to do something, whether it's thermal blocks or incorporating a combination of rigid board to get that continuous insulation. Uh, and metal belt building uh, requirements in certain northern tier climate zones are up in the 19 uh, or 13 range. You know, but the bottom line is, is continuous insulation helps to meet the required energy code R values or U factors. And this diagram just serves to illustrate the point of that traditional construction and steel frame building that I described where you use the, the insulation packed between the stud cavity. You can see the thermal leakage on the left at the framing members. Whereas if you use a rigid foam board continuous insulation material, it essentially puts an envelope around there to minimize that thermal leakage. As you look at the code requirements uh, for steel frame walls, you can see the evolution of what's occurred since 2006. Uh, when continuous insulation was first introduced, it was introduced into the climate zones where they were predominantly heating environments in the north. So in 2006, you see zones five and above have continuous insulation requirements, which are the plus factors there. So in zone five, R13 in the stud cavity plus 3.8 continuous insulation, or zone eight plus seven and a half. That was the 2006 version. 2009 version, you saw that uh, the uh, requirements expanded to zones three and four with steel frame buildings. And then in 2012, uh, continuous insulation was required starting in zones one and two and expanded throughout uh, uh, all climate zones for steel frame construction. And that really hasn't changed since the 2012 modification. When you look at polyiso continuous insulation or continuous insulation in general, there's all kinds of different applications. Um, traditionally, above grade walls are insulated on the exterior side of the wall, um, but it can be in the core or it can be on the interior. So if you look at the diagram in the top left, uh, you know, insulated concrete sandwich panels are being used where the insulation is embedded between uh, the interior and exterior uh, concrete layers. And that's becoming fairly common. In the bottom right picture, if they're not 
using the insulated concrete panel and they're leaving the concrete exposed to the exterior, the only place you have, the only choice you have is to insulate on the interior side. Uh, so there is a number of foam boards that are being used in that uh, arena as well. With polyiso, there are certain foam products, uh, certain formulation products that can be left exposed to the interior without a thermal barrier covering because they pass the NFPA 286 fire test. Uh, if they don't pass that test, they've got to be covered uh, with, with some sort of thermal barrier. Uh, but if they do, um, you know, it, it, it's acceptable to leave them exposed. But typically, you'll see usage in the other, you know, as, as shown in the other diagrams here, where it's to the exterior side of the wall, either over a gypsum sheathing or directly to framing numbers or over CMU or, or concrete walls, and then barriers and claddings incorporated. Just further detail on this, um, you know, Continuous insulation can and is used with uh, can be and is used with wood framing, steel framing, or, or mass wall construction. And the diagram on the right shows an interior CMU application where the polyiso is put up directly to the, the the CMU. You'll notice they're using hat channels here, so that would be a polyiso product that doesn't have NFPA 285 uh, 286 uh, approval. Um, in the past, it was common to see z furring used for such an application, but just like when we talked about steel frame application and the thermal leakage that occurs there, z furring has been uh, frowned upon in a lot of areas because it's got an attachment to the exterior wall and to the interior wall. So it has uh, a thermal pathway uh, for leakage just like a steel stud would. Uh, so the preferred application these days is more along the lines of what you see here with a hat channel, eliminating, eliminating that direct transfer of the steel attachment uh, to the, from the inside to the outside. Continuous insulation, and specifically polyiso continuous insulation, can be used as an air barrier um, when you, you do so, uh, you're going to have to, to seal the joints. Um, it's prescriptive in the code, and we've got a slide a little later in the presentation on that. It's prescriptive in the code that uh, foil phase polyiso or even extruded rigid foam board uh, over a half inch thick is, uh, is classified as an air barrier and meets air barrier qualifications uh, with sealed or tape seams. Weather resistive barrier functionality is available as well with continuous insulation foam board products, um, but it only applies to specific products in tested applications. So it's not prescriptive in the code just by a certain thickness or, or a specific uh, uh, sealant. Um, manufacturers have to take their products and get them tested to be classified as a, a water resistive barrier. Um, so if somebody is looking to use those products as that function, you gotta make sure that they have the testing and uh, information to, uh, to satisfy that need. Um, it, it mentions here approved flashing tape or sealant. Typically you've gotta have a certain width tape. Um, most of the time that's four inch wide to ensure proper adhesion. Uh, two inches on each side of the seam. Or now there are some liquid tapes that don't require as wide a coverage, but they fill joints uh, a little bit uh, better um, than maybe what a tape would. Uh, so they provide some flexibility. Uh, they're basically flashing sealants. But either which way, you can get a, a, a durable, long-lasting code compliant assembly uh, that can serve these functions uh, with uh, rigid continuous insulation board. So as we move on to topic number three, uh, we'll talk uh, energy code compliance. And uh, everyone I'm sure is familiar with the climate zone map. Um, when you look at what uh, the IECC has done 
over the course of time and the changes that have been made. We went through, you know, what happened with steel frame wall assemblies from 2006 to 2009 to 2012. Uh, it's resulted in some pretty significant savings um, over the prior version. So you can see it was uh, almost 9% savings, uh, the 2009 version of the IECC. Uh, and then it more than doubled when they went to the 2012 and expanded continuous insulation requirements to all climate zones. So it can have a very big impact on energy conservation. And you're going to continue to, to, to see it uh, expand uh, across the country. Um, as you look at the codes and the code requirements, for continuous insulation. Uh, when you look at walls, there's three basic approaches. In a framed wall assembly, you could put just cavity insulation only in there. Now, it doesn't mean it satisfies the code, but that's one basic approach to insulating. Um, you can do cavity insulation plus continuous insulation, which is what's prevalent in framed walls in the uh, in the building code, or you can do continuous insulation only. So you put everything exterior of the framing and leave the stud cavity vacant. And that's becoming uh, a preferred method for a lot of the building science consultants out there uh, because their recommendation is, you know, taking all your thermal, air, moisture, and water management to the exterior side of the wall. And we'll talk about that a little further in subsequent slides. When it comes to the energy code, there's, there's three paths to compliance, um, prescriptive R value, uh, performance U factor, and then uncertainty analysis or, or trade-off methodology, computer modeling. So the first one we'll talk about is the uh, prescriptive R value uh, pathway. And you can see in, in all the climate zones, whether it be the 2012, 15, or, or 2018 version of the IECC, uh, the continuous insulation requirement, as, it, as designated by the, the letter CI there, is present in, in all types of walls in all climate zones. Um, mass walls, because there is no stud cavity there, everything that's required is CI. Steel framed and, and metal building and wood frame all have some composite mechanism there uh, or hybrid mechanism for complying. Whereas say zone four, you look at a steel framed wall, it's R13 insulation in the stud cavity and R7.5 continuous insulation to the outside of the framing number. Metal building R13 in the in the cavity in R13 uh, on the exterior or the outside of the framing members, exterior or interior. Wood frame is the only one that has an option that does not include the letter CI, and that's because wood framing is less conductive than steel framing. So you can, you can do a hybrid system say a two by four wood framed wall and, and put R13 uh, insulation in the stud cavity and uh, whatever the requirement is in zone four, for example, 3.8 CI to the exterior side. Or you can potentially go to two by six framing and put an R20 in the stud cavity and uh, forego the continuous insulation. Uh, the wood lobby is pretty strong. Uh, they, they lobbied for this because of the conductivity, and it has been included in the code. Uh, so there is that option there. But with the, with the prescriptive path, all you're doing is picking materials that meet those minimum R values that are contained for the climate zone in the code and using them in the wall assembly, and you can pass. U factor is uh, a little bit different, and, and this this allows you to incorporate the components within the wall assembly um, because every component has some sort of, a, uh, of an R value, or most components do. 
So I mentioned earlier that some of the building science consultants are recommending taking everything to the exterior side of the wall. Um, with this, the U-factor method, you can do that. So you're adding up the R values of all the different components and air spaces within the wall assembly to get the U value. Uh, U value is a reciprocal of R value, but it's not a direct comparison, you've got to take into account the framing path. So the U values are taken from the table. Uh, in this instance, the highlighted one happens to be zone four for metal framed walls. You've got to have a U value that falls below the 0.064 measurement. So R value you're trying to exceed, U value you're trying to get underneath. The way to calculate U value is, um, is you take the ingredients or, or the components within the wall, and you've got, to, you've got to calculate the values in the framing path and the cavity path. And with steel framing 16 inches on center, the code states that you use a framing factor of 0.25. So you're gonna multiply the framing path times 0.25 and the cavity path times 0.75. So if you look at the chart there, you can add up the R values for all the components in the framing path and you get an 8.67 and all the components in the cavity path and get an 18.68. Then you look at the formula over on the left and you're multiplying that 8.67 from the framing path times 0.25 and the 18.68 from the cavity path times 0.75 and you come up with a U value of 0.062, which is lower than the, the, the 0.064, which was contained in the code. So you know you've got a, an assembly that works or is compliant with the U factor. The, the third pathway is uncertainty analysis, where you take uh, computer modeling or energy modeling programs like ComCheck or Woofie or other software and you do trade-offs, so you can upgrade, uh, you know, add more insulation in the roof or upgrade HVAC equipment or do something special with windows so it allows you to trade off potentially in one area for another. We won't get into detail in that in this uh, presentation, but that's certainly another pathway that can be taken. And then the last topic we'll go into here is uh, uh, building code compliance. And uh, we'll talk about fire structural and, uh, and w fire wind uh, and building science. First, we'll talk about fire. Um, certainly uh, foam plastic insulated sheathing is a plastic, so uh, it does uh, have certain fire requirements it needs to meet, and those are contained in chapter 26 of the building code. Uh, fire resistance rated walls or hourly rated walls are important and come into play when buildings are within certain proximity of one another. Thermal barrier requirements, uh, we talked about earlier with exposed material to the inside of buildings. There are certain products that can uh, meet NFPA 286, which is an exposed interior burn test. If they don't meet that test, then they need to be covered by a thermal barrier. Uh, there are potential heat requirements, um, which is often incorporated into the NFPA 285 requirement as well. But these two are the biggies that you see on a more common basis when it comes to fire. Uh, the first is flame spread index, which is ASTM E84. Typically, uh, you're looking at either less than 75 flame spread or less than 25 flame spread for foam insulations. And then NFPA 285, which is a large scale multi-story test that measures fire propagation um, and movement uh, in a vertical fashion from a lower floor room up a wall to a second floor uh, uh, area. E84 is, is a test that uh, is common and used for all kinds of materials. It's a horizontal test. Um, that is uh, also called the, the, the Steiner Tunnel Test. Um, materials are mounted to a, a ceiling assembly in the test tunnel. Fire starts at one end and they measure how fast and how far the flame travels. 
and then they measure smoke develop coming out the other end. Um, polyiso is what they call a thermoset material, whereas uh, polystyrene products, the expanded and extruded, are, are thermoplastic products. So all foams aren't equal. We showed the R value differences earlier, um, but they're not equal in terms of fire performance either. Um, thermosets perform much better in, in fire circumstances or even in high heat circumstances than thermoplastics. And the best analogy I can give is think of a stick of butter versus a piece of bread. And if you take a stick of butter and you place it near a heat source, uh, if the heat gets warm enough, it will start to change form or shape. If you remove the heat source, um, it, it will cool, but it'll be in a different shape than when it started. And if you expose it to direct fire, it's going to melt and drip and eventually, uh, um, you know, puddle. And, and that's how thermoplastics perform in fire environments. So they don't do well in fire tests specifically. Thermoset materials like polyiso are, are more analogous to the piece of bread, where if you place it near a heat source, it stays in its shape, but it forms a char layer on the surface. Um, it will eventually ignite and burn if the temperature gets hot enough, but the, the, the melting point compared to a, a thermoplastic, thermoplastics soften it at 165 uh, degrees Fahrenheit and they start to melt around 200, whereas uh, thermosets, depe depending upon the formulation and product, uh, have a combustion point of somewhere between six and 800 degrees Fahrenheit, so significantly different. So uh, a thermoset product stays intact during exposure to heat or flame. If you remove the flame, it'll self-extinguish, but you know that's one of the reasons why you see it in direct-to-deck application and roofing. Um, it's not gonna melt and drip on people's heads through a metal deck. That same type of fire performance attributes allows it to perform very well in, in, in wall fire testing, uh, whether it be E84 or uh, uh, NFPA 285. So NFPA 285, it's a picture of it on this screen here. It's a two-story test where the bottom floor room, they start a fire in the interior side of the room. It burns for five minutes. It's led through the window and out simulating flash over flash over and up the exterior side of the wall. Flames can't propagate more than a certain distance vertically or laterally above or to the side of the window heading. And then they've got multiple ther uh, thermocouples placed throughout the wall. And uh, those measure heat. Um, and essentially it's a 30 minute pass fail burn. You can't trigger any of the thermocouples by reaching a temperature that's uh, that's higher than uh, what's limited. Uh, flames can't uh, reach certain points beyond uh, the window header. And polyiso does very well in these tests um, with all kinds of different claddings. Uh, polystyrenes typically only pass with uh, non-combustible claddings, uh, brick, stone, stucco, things like that. And because the flame passes through the window header, they're gonna require potentially special header detailing, either mineral wool pinned to the head of the window or special heavy gauge steel lintels. So uh, uh, test information for NFPA 285 is incumbent upon the manufacturer to do the testing and provide it. Happy to say within the last 10 years, a uh, tremendous amount of testing has been done and most manufacturers uh, who are out there will be able to provide information on wall assemblies. Keep in mind that NFPA 285 is a full wall assembly test and not a product test. So you don't have a product that passes NFPA 285. It's components within the assembly. Foam plastics trigger the need for an NFPA 285 test, uh, as do combustible claddings or combustible weather barriers. So be aware of that. From a, a wind pressure resistance standpoint, any sheathing materials, whether it's a foam board or, or other product, chip sheathing, other product, uh, needs to uh, 
provide wind pressure resistance and codes uh, have a provision that ensure that uh, all materials and claddings will meet that. For polyiso products, uh, there is information available through uh, the technical arm of Pima. Uh, you can get that uh, through these websites, and a copy of this presentation will be made available in a PDF format uh, following the presentation. But they can provide pathways for code compliance uh, and approval. Um, uh, meeting the wind pressure requirements that exist out there. From a building science standpoint, um, mentioned some of the building science uh, uh, consultants out there that talk about taking all the insulation to the outside. Really what they're trying to do is create a warm, breathable wall. Uh, take the, the moisture and thermal and all that to the exterior side. Uh, continuous insulation because the closed cell formulation and the thermal resistance it provides can, can significantly reduce condensation potential. Um, whereas non-insulated sheathings, you know, don't do that. And you can have, you know, the, 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 the back of the sheathing being cold and you've got the warm air in a heating environment from uh, the interior that meets on the back side of the sheathing and creates condensation potential, which can be really bad in the stud cavity. Polyiso can and is often used in conjunction with separate water resistant barriers or air barriers. And those barriers can go on the back side up against the, the base wall or on the top side of the foam insulation. Um, either which way is, is being done throughout the country. A lot of the building scientists are recommending putting it on the top side or the exterior side of the insulation. That allows you to see penetrations that are being made in the, the water resistive barrier or air barrier, uh, as opposed to it being behind the insulation where any penetrations, um, you can't see the holes that are being made. Um, you know, you can at least see them and fix them if it's on the exterior side. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, polyiso foam board can also be used as the water resistive barrier or air barrier with proper detailing as well. You know, for water resistant barrier functionality, you know, bulk water is the main concern and uh, you need to make sure if it's going to be used in that fashion that proper flashing tapes or seam sealants are used and those seam sealants are, are the ones that have been tested with the material. Um, WRBs are typically required for almost all wall assemblies um, and they just got to provide good drainage. Uh, it's important because, uh, you know, buildings are meant to keep the, the water out, and uh, that's an important component in the overall assembly. Um, from a vapor resistance uh, transmission side of things, um, ISO products can provide full vapor barrier functions or vapor retarder functions. Foil face product with tape seams is essentially an impermeable barrier. If you don't want it to be impermeable, you don't have to tape the seams and you can use separate barrier materials, such as permeable bar barrier materials with that. There are also, as mentioned, other facers that have a little bit of greater permeability and you can create semi-permeable and permeable wall assemblies as well. Polyiso insulation along with extruded polystyrene are, are some of the materials that are prescriptive in the code listed as air barriers, uh, half inch or greater, along with gyp board or closed cell spray foam. So just know if these products are being used in the taping or sealing the seams, you're gonna get an air barrier. Um, so hopefully uh, I touched on all of the learning objectives that we set out at the beginning of the presentation, talking about what the role of CI is, what the definition is, and the different types of products talked about the various applications and, uh, and then went into the, the energy and building code compliance uh, requirements and, and options. Um, with that, I've used up most of the time here today, uh, but uh, if there are questions, uh, I don't know how that works with this uh, setup, but uh, Jason, if, if there are questions, please uh, 
go ahead. I still have time to, to, to answer them. Yeah, we have a few. Great. Nice job, Grant. Thank you. Um, see, uh, the first one, I've had a contractor tell me that the thermal spacers required can aren't allowed by the manufacturer of the metal. Have you heard of thermal spacers and issues with the uh, code requirements and thermal spacers in metal buildings? So I'm peripherally familiar with that. Uh, I don't have a ton of information there, but yeah, you've got metal building manufacturers who, who have certain requirements or specifications for their buildings. And I think the metal building side of things is playing a bit of catch up right now with this continuous insulation requirement and the fact that, you know, they always felt that they were con they were using continuous insulation because the fiberglass was being draped across the purlins or girts. And now that you've got to put certain spacers in there, oftentimes what's being used as spacers are EPS blocks, expanded polystyrene blocks, which don't necessarily have the greatest fire performance. Um, so depending upon where they're placed, if they're placed on the front side versus the back side, I, I think that there's probably some manufacturer specific system requirements that involve that in terms of whether it'll meet the fire rating or not. That's probably where it's coming from. Probably coming from the fire rating. That makes sense. Um, has foil faced poly ISO been tested and approved to be utilized as a WRB? It has, but it's specific to manufacturers. Okay. Um, and, and quite truthfully, if, if a manufacturer wants to go and do the test, foil facing is a great facing for a WRB, but really that test for a WRB is about the detailing at the scene and using the proper sealant materials at the seams. So if, if a company, a specific manufacturer has gone and done the testing, I know my company has, uh, we've got uh, a few different options for foil face products and WRB functionality with either a liquid or a tape seam sealant. But to be classified as a WRB, you do have to, to, to pass that testing. It's not just inferred. Gotcha. And then I'm guessing you might have had ASHRAE 90.1 prescriptive numbers up. I just had a comment. Thought continuous insulation in climate zone three was five, not 3.8. Is there a discrepancy between 90.1 and IECC there? You know what? I, I, I don't have it right in front of me, but yes, there are discrepancies. You know, for a while, ASHRAE and IECC went hand in hand up to about 2009. Mm -hmm. And then my understanding, both organizations can get a bit political. Oh, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a stated goal by the IECC to meet certain energy saving requirements mm -hmm. uh, with the move to the 2012 goal. And ASHRAE got bogged down in something, so they just reprinted uh, their 2007 version in 2010, and they started to diverge a little bit. So there are some differing requirements there um, from that time period on. Right. Well, I know in the uh, 2018 IECC, they don't reference ASHRAE Standard 169 for the climate zone map. So it's super significant for Texas because Dallas Fort Worth, you know, Dallas, one of the largest growing biggest construction areas in the country and 90.1 2016 Dallas Fort Worth, uh, Tarrant and Dallas counties moved from climate zone three to climate zone two, which a lot of times the difference between two and three is fairly significant. And then not only that, we also have a lot of construction down in McAllen Brownsville down in the Valley. And ASHRAE 90.1 2016 climate zone map for McAllen Brownsville, they're now in climate zone one instead of climate yep. zone two. So, so we're, we're, we're going to have a little bit of growing pains, hopefully in the 2021 IECC. I haven't looked at the code proposals. Oh, I've looked at them, but I haven't really looked at them thoroughly. Hopefully they're going to start referencing ASHRAE standard 169 so that we have the same climate zone map in the two codes. Uh, yeah, but I know yeah. that's an issue. Well, that's all the questions. Uh, great job, Grant. Uh, really appreciate that.
and uh, and if you can send me that by PDF, we'll get it out to all the folks with the course evaluation. Uh, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, we'll let you guys get back to work. Well, we are right on time, eight uh, nine thirty one. Everybody have a fantastic day. Thanks for joining us this morning, and we will see you back in two weeks with our next uh, Speakers Bureau webinar. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you.